Hello, hi everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're located. Um, you will notice that everyone is muted and also your camera is off. Uh, if you are willing to add any, um, any feedback or if you want to ask any question, feel free to do it in the chat. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session in which you will be able to ask your questions. So you can already type your questions in the Q&A section. And if you want to speak, we can also give you um, the mic at the end. Uh, and you need to re request it by raising your hand. Um, so I see that we have many attendees already in the joining us. Uh, we're going to wait an extra 30 seconds because we have a very busy program today. Um, and then I will give um, Elwin a welcome and let him introduce the, the topic of today. All right, um, maybe Elwin, you want to start? OK. Um... Just making sure there's no one waiting in the lobby. OK, look, um, look, thanks everyone for joining. It's great you could be here. We only have an hour and we have a lot of things to discuss, so I will be super quick. Um, my name is Elwin Granger-Jones. I'm the executive director of the Cradle to Cradle Product Innovation Institute. Um, I think this is going to be a fascinating hour. Um, the perspective I take on this is, is really a, a career spent trying to create change where um, I just have so much sympathy for the challenges those on this call face in, in, in trying to create institutional change in their organizations and in their markets to meet the really ambitious environmental social goals that we all know are so important. Um, Cradle to Cradle set up many years ago, uh, developed a framework and, and a way to measure uh, achievements in this space. What's happened, and, and when we did that, um, it was a relatively lonely space. There wasn't so many other certifications. There wasn't so much legislation. What this webinar is about is to reflect the absolute sea change in the landscape, particularly on, on, on regulations that has happened since we were created. And we took um, a long look at this um, with, with colleagues, uh, Baptiste, who, who will introduce himself in a moment, and um, with uh, Lucy's support, to really look at What's the what's the alignment? Um, to what extent does doing a cradle to cradle certification on which a lot of this regulation was based take you above and beyond, um, but also include um, me being in compliant with that legislation? And actually, it's really encouraging what, what we saw. And that's partly because we've crafted various updates to our certification to enable that. And it's also because the, the principles on which cradle to cradle were based were so formative in the way uh, a lot of enlightened le legislation in the EU, in the EU is, is, is to try and come at these things. So let's get straight into it. Um, I'd like uh, uh, Baptiste to introduce himself and I hand straight to you, Baptiste. Thanks a lot, uh, Elwin, for this uh, presentation, and uh, thank uh, Lucy and Elwin both for the for the trust you have um, invested in us in this in this project. So, good um, morning, all of you. Good afternoon, all of you, depending on where you are based. I'm uh, Baptiste Carrier Pradal, the co-founder of um, To Be Policy. I don't know, Lucy, if you have already changed the slide. Um, and uh, therefore, it's a company that we have uh, created now together with Bento Bauer a few years ago. And our idea is to be able to support brands, industry associations, certificate holders, and others in understanding the upcoming EU legislation, to have a full visibility on what's coming up, to be able from there to create and to write a bit their pathway to ensure compliance. And we also support some time uh, in the journey to ensure that the company can uh, reach out compliance. So we look at legislation, all legislation linked to sustainability, not only indeed at EU level, but also at member state level. And we have some other partners in other geographies. And we cover from due diligence, CSRD, ESPR, and many other beautiful acronyms that you will be hearing about in the next few slides. 
Um, and myself, I have, I'm based, I'm French, as you can already hear, I'm based out of Amsterdam, uh, where also Cradle to Cradle happened to have an office. Um, and I've ha I have now uh, nearly 20 years of experience in sustainability, having lived and um, worked in uh, Asia, in Eastern Europe, and in other geographies. Um, and I'm therefore excited to be able to make the link between operationally and strategically what the sustainability means from supply chain to boardrooms, as well as uh, meeting, uh, making the connection with the imperative of EU legislation. If you want to reach out to me, don't hesitate to add me on LinkedIn or connect me. I will be happy to follow up with all of you. Lucy, I give you back the floor. The idea is that actually in this conversation, when uh, initially there was a conversation linked to um, supporting a transition, it's important to have an overall idea about what's happening today. What we know today is that, and you have heard already a lot about it, is that the European Commission has launched many years ago now its Green Deal. The Green Deal was really meant to be the powerhouse that was supporting the European Commission in meeting the Paris Agreement, uh, echoing what Elwin, Elwin was mentioning in order to be able to reduce the environmental impact. So was also the ambition of the European Commission. And therefore, they created a full spectrum of legislation that a bit in the same way that you try to understand sometimes uh, the environmental impact, you have legislation for every stage of the life of a product or a service. The European Commission did so, creating legislation covering product extraction, product sourcing, product management, product marketing, transportation, and everything in many multiple sectors. Here you have an illustration of the type of legislation we talk about from FRAM to FOR, that will be the legislation uh, regarding agricultural sector in the European Commission, where there is a strong element regarding supporting the reduction of the environmental impact and supporting the increase of biodiversity of the um, agricultural processes and policies. There is regulation regarding transitioning to a circular economy that we'll talk about more later on and other legislation which uh, will be here to ensure that there is a increased um, climate ambition of the European Commission. That's why, for instance, again, many legislation come back to requiring to have a better perspective regarding carbon footprinting, requiring better perspective into creating ambitious plan to be able to reduce the footprint, etc., etc. So it's important to have in mind that the European Commission had this over umbrella, the EU Green Deal, where many legislation were created. And before we carry on, um, keep in mind that also many of those laws are passed. You may have heard that there is a change of mood in the European Commission or other elements, but all what we talk about is very often legislation which have already been voted, new laws which have been enacted or which are being finalized, and are therefore different actors will have to a bid by. So that's a bit the general context in which we are evolving, so a demanding level of ambition from the European Commission. Now, Lucy, I can give you the floor. So thank you, uh, Baptiste. Um, and uh, you will have uh, the chance to have two French-speaking uh, people in this uh, in this webinar. So um, it was a real pleasure to work together with Tubi Policy and many of their um, of their employees, and uh, we we worked towards this great gap analysis that you can see in front of you. So um, they've been doing uh, an extensive research on the different pieces of legislation that were already adopted and that were about to be adopted to define which ones were the most relevant and um, the most aligned with Credit Cradle certified. So you can see in front of you the different legislation that were selected to be uh, analyzed and, um, and compared with the Credit Cradle certified product standard. And the green ones, uh, the ones that are in green, are the ones that have been now mapped and the EU taxonomy is still one that will be uh, completed by the end of the year. Knowing that for some of them, uh, the texts are probably not finalized yet and there are some drafts, uh, additional pieces of legislation that are, that are being written right now. So the work um, is not finalized and there's still more to do, obviously, in that space. Um, and we're going to start with the Green Claims Directive, and I think Betis will present it to you better than I do. But this is the most crucial uh, piece of legislation because it doesn't only uh, tell what companies need to claim and how do they um, phrase for future marketing campaigns, but it's also regulating how environmental labeling schemes like Credit Credit Certified um, is is act is is working and is um, its 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 governance is is um, is planned. Thank you, Lucy. 
Therefore, if we look at the upcoming legislation regarding green claim, let's first take a step back and what are we talking about here? Technically, what's happening is that the European Commission came to the conclusion, like also many other industries and many sectors, like if we are to transition to a more sustainable, a less environmentally impactful and uh, in uh, sector and industry, then we have to make sure that consumers are also empowered to support the transition, that they are better educated, that they are better informed, and that they have access to better information. So therefore, while recognizing also that this strategy is not the alpha and the omega of the change, that it's just one of the many elements that will support a change in Europe, empowered consumer become one, became one strong axis of work of the European Commission. Therefore, the first work that the Commission did is to evaluate the quality of the information that the consumers are subject to. By doing so, the European Commission uh, has reviewed different certification schemes, different claims, different statements made by the different industries and concluded that, um, as you can see on the slide, let's say more than half of the claims provided were either vague or misleading or directly unfounded. So therefore, that more than half of the claim were, to put it in other words, greenwashing. They also went further to find that there was a lack of, of evidence um, that um, was behind many of the claim. And that ultimately, that means that the consumers were doubting the information they were receiving. So therefore, if consumers are doubting the information you are receiving, it became complicated for companies which are doing a lot, for uh, companies which are creating products which are definitely more uh, with a lesser environmental impact than the competition. And therefore, it became more complicated for those companies from those products to emerge from a big noise created in part because of greenwashing. So therefore, that's why the European Commission decided to launch a new piece of legislation, actually two new pieces of legislation, one called the Consu Empowering Consumer in the Green Transition, Consumer Empowerment, and the other one regarding substantiating green claim. Very simply put, one is here to tell you what words you can use and the general framework you have to follow. And another one is here to tell you exactly how you should calculate, measure, substantiate every claim you want to make, if you want to claim that you are carbon neutral, if you have to claim that you have a reduction of the water footprint of your product, of your company, if you want to be able to make a statement that I will be carbon neutral by 2040, all of that now will be strictly regulated about what does that entail for your organization to have implemented before being allowed to make such a claim publicly. And this green claim also, what it differs from today's perspective is that we move away from a time like today, that if you make a wrong claim, if you accuse of greenwashing, there is no fine today, technically speaking. People are required to stop making the claim. In the future, they will be fined up to 5% or multiple percent point of a company overall revenue. Um, uh, and therefore, that will be more significant. So therefore, that's more or less the uh, general objective of the um, substantiating green claim regulation to be able to support um, the different uh, elements. And therefore, what we uh, do identify is that the law will require different steps that people have to follow in order to meet the requirement of the substantiating green claim regulation. So if we go on the next slide, you will be able to see a bit already what are the uh, different elements which are created. We know that um, in the expectation, there is an expectation to have definitely much better quality data. There is um, a requirement to be able to have more information regarding the most impactful element. There is requirement to have more uh, methodology and better evidence to be able to bring the claim to the market. And therefore, the work that we've been doing is to be able to identify all of those different type of requirements for all the different types of element to be able to provide this information to Cradle to Cradle to be able to prepare for the update of their own system. Lucie. Yeah, thank you, Baptiste. Um, so, yeah, it was important for us uh, to start as a prior um, requirement and how we started our, our work with to be policy to to make sure that our certification will remain um, aligned, but also that our uh, certification scheme will comply with the upcoming requirements for other uh, labeling schemes. So um, it was a great process and um, and we are confident that we will be um, accredited by the European Union, by one of the national bodies um, when the claim, well, the when the directive will be uh, adopted. So, just as a 
as a, in terms of timeline, the Green Claims Directive was not yet adopted, but it expected to be uh, finalized and the adoption to be finalized by the end of this year. So it will enter into force in two years. Um, so companies will need to be following this, uh, these requirements as of 2027. So by having the Credit Cradle certification, Credit Cradle certified certification, uh, you are already ahead of things. Uh, this certification is a very holistic certification, as you are aware. So it allows you to make environmental claims that goes from material health. So how do you um, how do you verify the safety of uh, chemicals and materials that are in your product? It also allows you to explain uh, the. It has a different. Uh, it has a roadmap, so it, it allows you to explain where you're at uh, for your product to become circular and to be uh, fully uh, closing the loop. It also hel helps you to get um, information on how do you reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, uh, how do you uh, reduce the quantity of water that you're um, um, using within your supply chain and or reusing within your supply chain, uh, as well as social um, criteria. So it gives you access to primary data, real numbers that you can use for your communication, for communication purposes, and that will give that will give an accurate claim and an accurate um, an accurate achievements that will be um, uh, communicated to the consumer or to your to your suppliers. Um, it definitely mitigates the risks, as Betty said. You can face legal repercussions, and we've seen that although the Green Claims Directive is not yet um, adopted, we've already seen some um, large multinationals that have been targeted for greenwashing. So it is very important to have third-party verification, like Cradle to Cradle Certified, to make sure that your claims are founded and accurate. And it will just overall also bring back the consumer's confidence because we see that there's a huge um, increase uh, in the demand for sustainable products. But the problem is that there is no um, regulatory environment right now. And um, therefore, this regulation will finally bring back the confidence. And by using trustworthy um, certification like Credit Credit Certified, you can already reassure the consumer or your suppliers about your sustainability and social achievements. And now there's another very interesting regulation that um, is very, uh, very much linked to the credit credit design principles. So we could tell, we could say that the credit, the eco design uh, regulation was based on the credit credit design principles. Um, and it will also show you that um, you are completely future proof by being credit credit certified uh, when you, we look at the different requirements from the eco design for sustainable products regulation. And now, Betty, I'll let you uh, present it. Thank you, Lucille. When the European Commission decided to launch the uh, Eco Design for Sustainable Product Regulation, or ESPR, initially the President of the Commission mentioned that this was actually the mother of all legislation. The law that we just discussed uh, before was regarding uh, greenwashing, so to tackle greenwashing, in, is enforced, will be enforced for communication from brand to consumer, B2C only. In this case, the legislation will apply to each and every piece of product which will be put on the EU market. The deployment will be progressive. Not every sector will have to apply it from day one. There will be a phase approach for the different sectors. We'll come back on that in a second. The key thing to have in mind is that the first sector that will be targeted, and this one is already being discussed in the European Commission, is the apparel sector or the um, textile um, sector. So ultim uh, ultimately, the idea is that there will be, for every piece of product sold on the EU market, a list of requirements that the product will have to bid by in order to be allowed to enter into the market and that the um, manufacturer or the importer, let's say the person or the organization putting the product on the market, will have to prove compliance in ways which will be determined later on. The first law, as we will see also later on the timeline, was adopted, and I will come back on that later. But the key thing to have in mind, uh, if we come back to the uh, first slide, is to say that um, the law which has been passed is, if you want, presenting a menu of options that the subsequent law will be taking uh, inspiration from. 
many products will have typically to uh, last longer. So there will be requirement potentially regarding the durability of the garment. There will be requirement very likely to be easily repairable. Depending on the sectors, this can uh, hide different recycling uh, different um, requirement. There will be very likely a obligation to use more recycled content in the sense that there could be threshold, which is expected, of mandatory incorporation of recycled material in all of the different products. With, as we've seen already for the batteries and for solar panel, a, a percentage of recycled content that will be incremental every five years with already a access which has been created by the legislator. So that means that there will be many requirements that um, can be selected again to match the reality on each and every sectors that will be discussed uh, in the years to come. And once you have a regulation to tackle your sector, as we say, the regulation, there is never a case when legislators have seen a regulation and removed it. So consider that it will be a first version and that as long as your professional career will go, those regulations will be year after year and uh, five years after five years implemented incrementally in order to be every time more demanding. So the piece of legislation that will be presented in the next years will be the step one of a long journey toward every time more requirements to ensure sustainability. So if we look at the timeline that is presented, the framework legislation called the Eco Design for Sustainable Product Regulation, this one has already been adopted in July 2024. That means that again, whatever happens in the Parliament, whatever happens in the Commission, this is done. The work leg legally from the first framework is finished. Now it's a European Commission that has to define exactly the requirement leveraging this big framework to tell for the apparel sector, for the beauty sector, for the toy sector, for the cement or building sector, what will be the type of requirement. The next deadline is by Q1, let's say by March 2025, the European Commission will be also providing its work plan. It means that it will be communicating in the next six months all of the sector that will be concerned and by when each and every sector will be actually falling under this legislation. For the first sector that we know about, which is already uh, happening right now as we speak, the apparel sector, let's say that the Delegated Act is expected to come into force by Q1 2026. As I mentioned, this will be defining minimum level requirement that everybody that wants to place a product in the market will have to bid by. Small, big, based in Canada, based in South Africa, based in China. That's not the topic. The moment that the product will be sold to a EU customer into the EU common market, then the product will have to bid by this new legislation. We expect that from the moment that you will know exactly what type of requirement we talk about. Do you have to use 5% of recycled cotton? Do you have to meet um, a uh, color fastness to washing of 4 or 3.4? Um, what are the requirements you may have to implement? We expect those to start from the earliest potential date being Q1 28, let's say 28, 29. Having in mind that the requirement kicking off here, we talk about requirement kicking off in the store, let's say in the entry into the EU market. So if we think about the different timelines to be able to implement it, if we think about the uh, length and the duration between the time a discussion happened and the time that you can change in the factory to the time the product is on the market, that takes already a lot of time. So therefore, that means that from the time the legislation will be there, it will be paramount for the companies to be able to start implementing it immediately. And therefore, the work with uh, Cradle to Cradle was definitely to identify what do we know today, what do we know will be part of the requirement, what will be in the future. That's why we'll also keep monitoring this legislation for the next two months, but already today, what we can build in order to be able to support Cradle to Cradle. And from this piece of legislation, there is particularly two points that I would like to zoom in in order to be able to um, already mention, which are, let's say, material. 
The first one is to say that um, in the general framework, particularly in this case for the textile uh, sector, there is a general ban for the destruction of unsold goods. This topic is very material because we know that this was a practice that was used by certain organization uh, because sometimes just of IP reason or other reasons to be able to discard and dispose of unsold goods. So the first ban is already being voted upon and will be implemented uh, subsequently with different requirements and transparency requirements, reporting on the number of products which are unsold, uh, what happens to the products which are unsold, et cetera, et cetera. That will be made mandatory. So yet another requirement for data to be provided and information to be provided. So this one was validated as part of the general framework and will be also clarified in the upcoming month and years. And then many of you may have already heard about the Digital Product Passport, aka the DPP. The DPP is a digital twin that is meant to be attached um, with every product sold on the EU market that will convey multiple information to different bodies, consumers, governments, um, recyclers, uh, retailers, and other players. What the law that was voted that I mentioned earlier, the ESPR law that was voted already um, this year, say tells that for every product, a DPP will be mandated. Stop. It just says that. It doesn't say yet exactly all of the info you have to abide by. It gives a sample of information that could be included, but sector by sector, the European Commission will revise all of the data points that could be part of a DPP, will be reflecting of those with the sectors, with stakeholders um, in a specific process to be able to ultimately, at the end of the process, freeze a first list of data that needs to always travel with the product. That raises many questions. How do you ensure that you can always, from a garment, even though the consumer has cut the tag, how do you ensure there is a permanent link between the garment, the DPPs, that again, the recyclers may benefit for it? Uh, what about the resellers? Um, if there is a secondhand stores or any other topics like that, so there is many questions. And of course, a key question about how many data points and which data points will be required by the authorities. But therefore, that's something that will be worked upon with a clear idea, ultimately, to be able to not only promote circularity, but also sometimes to collect data to be able to report on other pieces of legislations that either we are not talking today or that will be presented by Lucy as being the object of another webinar, such as the CSDD, the due diligence regulation in Europe, or like the forced labor regulation, that is also uh, a topic which is uh, being analyzed. And that could require certain data that uh, could be part of the DPP for the reporting for the government. But again, when the law of the ESPR will hit your sector or the type of product and co or commodity that you are providing, then we can expect a significant change into the way the products are designed, the, pro the way the products are made. And that will increase definitely and define a new level playing field that every player will have to abide by in order to be able to follow those. On this note, see, I'm keen to give you back the floor. So it is quite interesting to see that the ESPR is just an entry uh, level certain, um, regulation right now. So it's, it gives a little hint of what is going to happen, but we don't, we're not really sure of what will be the requirements, the specific requirements, and what companies will need to comply with. So when uh, analyzing uh, what the ESPR is already mentioning and our requirements from C2C certified, we could see that C2C certified is simply the baseline of the ESPR requirements. So the different requirements on upgradability, on recyclability, on number of recycled content, all of this is mentioned in the in the regulation, and the Cradle to Cradle certified is also um, having specific requirements on those. What is quite interesting with Cradle to Cradle certified is that, as you are aware, uh, there are different incremental steps. So it's, it is a roadmap with different requirements that are getting stricter and stricter over time. 
and there is this continuous improvement as a requirement for companies to improve over time with, for instance, the percentage of recycled content that needs to be integrated or recyc the recyclability rates of these products, uh, as well as um, reducing greenhouse gas emission over time throughout the whole supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite interesting to see that Credit Credo Certify is already giving these, um, these, these specific thresholds and requirements um, that the ESPR will also um, um, continue to develop over time. But by being Credit Credo Certified, you're already ahead of things and you're already future proof for the upcoming ESPR dedicated acts. And of course, uh, Credit Credo Certified will keep evolving uh, as long as the, the text will be released. We will keep um, re reviewing them and um, upgrading the standard according to these um, upcoming new thresholds and requirements that will be set by the by the European Commission. And it is Credo to Credo Certified is the only certification that is assessing your circularity achievements. So to, to fully verify that your um, ongoing for process to make your products, to design your products a more circular way, that they're designed for circularity, well, Credo to Credo, Credo, Credo Certified is already giving you the tool to achieve excellence in that field. Um, circularity, as we all know, it's very hard to achieve and therefore, Credit Credo Certified gives you the different steps, incremental steps to follow to achieve it over time and to work all together to bring this uh, infrastructure that is needed um, to fully close the loop and the cycle. So, um, yeah, the sector specific dedicated acts will obviously bring specific requirements per sectors. And therefore, uh, we also update our documents um, based on that. We have the recycled content that is also um, defined uh, depending on the different material type. Uh, and this will keep being updated according to, to the thresholds that will be defined. Um, when you think about upcoming regulations, I think you companies think mostly about the compliance burden. It's, it looks like it's a lot to comply with all of these requirements. And therefore, by having the credit credit certified certification, you know that your products will be ready for what's coming in, um, in the sense of meeting the ESPR requirements. And by pr uh, designing products that are not only compliant, but that stay innovative in a market that will be truly regulated now. And when we talk about the digital product passport, which is the big topic right now, um, well, as Betsy clearly explained, uh, the the different data points that will be required to be disclosed and published are not yet defined. And now, um, through the Credit Credit Certified certification, you get with version 4.1 and version 4.0 a circularity data report uh, that looks like this and that gives you access to many data points that have been verified, such as the different um, circular sourcing uh, information, different circularity um, design and circular circularity system. So all aspects that are linked to the circularity um, of, of your products can be uh, visible on this sheet and will be publicly available on the product registry. So you are able to access this, this sheet and to share it with your consumers, with your suppliers, and tell that you have the first digital product passport that is also verified by a trusted independent verification certification. Um, and there's also information on the cycling instructions or the packaging, uh, packaging information. What is very important to close the loop is to give the right tools to, um, to the recyclers to understand what are the materials in the product um, how do you dismantle the different components um, on the product to make sure that they will be cycled the right way? And, and then how can it be cycled? So all of this is now requested part of the certification, uh, part of the certification requirements to give uh, access to everyone to this information and help the consumer also to make better informed decisions. Uh, talking about regulations, we're 
hearing a lot about the CSRD. It is a regulation that has always already been uh, adopted and some companies need to report as of next year. So it is becoming um, a hot topic in the in the space of sustainability. And therefore, we thought it was important to give you a brief uh, overview of this regulation today. But I must also explain that next week we'll go more in depth into this one because it is a very large piece uh, and we want to provide you all the tools that you need to understand how the certification can help you to comply with this uh, reporting requirement. Baptiste, I'll let you explain more about this. Yes, thank you, Lucy. At the beginning, I started when I mentioned about the EU Green Deal to say that actually the European Commission, when it started to regulate different sectors, was having a view of also re um, regulating every stage of um, the life cycle or the development of a product or a material. That there is regulation regarding extraction, production, marketing, etc., etc. Actually, this CSRD is the first law that was voted, let's say the big first law that was voted by this European Commission. And what it does, it's now taking the approach of what steps an organization has to do operationally before starting to think about its production of, and the betterment of its environmental footprint or its social footprint. And therefore, the first element is to need to know what is your footprint, what is your impact, and in this case, to report upon it. So the first obligation that the European Commission created is this CSRD. It's, as its name mentioned, an obligation of reporting. There is no between judgment on what you'll be reporting. There will be no judgment on if you uh, communicate about a very high carbon footprint or a very low, or that's not being judged. Here it's harmonizing what you have to report upon, which data, which KPI one has to report upon to enable comparison between different organizations, primarily with the idea of enabling financial institutions, investors, and other players into understanding the environmental performance and the social performance. As part of the CSRD, there is multiple indicators which are created, some which are material. Therefore, that means that you have and you are obliged to report upon them and some that for which the materiality will be evaluated for each and every company individually, depending on their sector, their size, um, the geographical footprint or their value chain, etc., etc. What we know is that there is three key pillars. There is one for the environment, where there is, for instance, mandatory disclosure of scope one, scope two, scope three emissions, plus multiple other indicators. There is reporting obligation regarding the social performance of your activities, and then on the overall governance. For all of those many different data points, many different explanations are required to be able to allow for this. So far, the reporting in the first instances will be more or less clear and then will be after more codified to enable for a quicker analysis of the reporting by the different element. The key element to say that, again, there is uh, the concept of double materiality, which is very important in this element that will be developed and touched upon into a subsequent uh, meeting. But it's important to have in mind, in a, in a nutshell, that in the particular case of the CSRD, beyond what, you what every organization has to report, you have to report on what is material for you in double way. First, what is material to you, let's say, inside out, in, which means like what type of impact your company has externally. Are you a big emitter of uh, GHG? Are you a big consumer of water? Do you have a particular chemical footprint, et cetera, et cetera? And also, what is material to you inside, uh, outside, in? Is climate change going to have an impact on your value chain? Is climate change going to have an impact on the habit of your customers uh, into how they will use, process, or buy your product or services? So therefore, there is this double view, hence the concept of double materiality, the materiality inside out, what the external world will have on your company because of climate change and other social evolutions, and inside out, what your organization will be impacting overall. 
So this piece of legislation is the first one again to uh, come into force. As mentioned by Lucy, it's already one very high topic by many companies. I'm sure that many of you on the calls already have teams to prepare for it because the first reporting are due very soon, as we are going to see in the next slides. The first idea is that this law was already voted and passed in uh, 2023. And there was a lot of debate, there was um, a lot of conversation, there was ultimately an extension of the timeline of the different companies that have to be uh, falling uh, by uh, the uh, follower under the legislation. They said the timeline was extended in extremis. But ultimately, the main idea is that from next year already, the biggest company will have to start reporting um, on uh, the uh, CSRD. And after, year after year, different company will have to report up to 2029, when let's say the last stretch of companies will have to report. In many cases, your reporting is done where you know which data you have to report upon. The um, the law will guide you in understanding which method you can apply in some cases, but you also have freedom to use different approaches. The law for that is not directive into how you have to calculate. It provides you general guidance. But this will unveil and unpack a ton of different data that not only are material for this legislation, but that will also serve for other legislation, how we could be um, discussing at a different moment. But it's a premiere in terms of legislation. Good to mark also, some of you may have heard about the concept of sector specific for the CSRD. This is a additional level of guidance that the European Commission will provide also for some sectors. This has been delayed, but that doesn't mean that the requirement to meet the CSRD is delayed. This one stays as per the agenda. It's just that for some sectors, there will be new guidance that will go even deeper into what you have to report and more importantly, how you're supposed to calculate it. So those two points will be added into subsequent iteration of the law that will be talking about the sector specific requirements. That's for the general perspective regarding the um, CSRD. Now back to Lucille about the implication for cradle to cradle. So when we look at the different requirements from the CSRD, if we look, well, I will go to this one afterwards. So if we look at the different uh, requirements from the CSRD, requirement disclosures, many of them are uh, simply similar as the requirements from credit credit certified. Um, the, C the CSRD took the environmental, social and uh, government governance um, disclosures um, that were found to be, um, well, the most uh, renowned, um, that they found uh, renowned, but Credit Cradle Certified is um, defining its its uh, environmental, social, um, depending on the, on the different um, um, categories. So when we look at how the certification is is framed, there are many many requirements in all of these different categories: requirements for material health, requirements for product circularity, for social um, fairness, and um, all these requirements must be met to achieve the certification. When we look at the CSRD, uh, companies need to report according to what they found to be material. So a company will um, have to. Um, define an LCA to conduct an LCA, a life cycle analysis, and based on this life cycle analysis, they will realize that what you found to be material, but on all the topics that were um, that were um, uh, verified with the certification. Uh, therefore, your well, it looks a bit um, a bit. It, it looks like it's a lot for companies who start reporting right now. But in the future, knowing that you will have more data that will be supporting your reports and make your reports be stronger than other companies on the market, it will really give you a market. Um, um, an additional um, market share and give you more um, and improve your reputation over time. When we look at why the CSRD was implemented, it is to attract more investors. So your company 
will prove to investors that you're doing more than what the CSRD is asking you to report on, if you're choosing, of course, to report on more topics than what was found to be material. But with Credit to Credit Certified, you will have the primary data to disclose um, what was verified for these um, environmental, social and governance practices. So this is more for the high level. And then when we look at what the CSRD is um, requesting, it is just to report. It doesn't prescribe any methodology. So it is difficult to, to navigate how to, how to prove uh, what, was, uh, what we'll be reporting because you need to audit the full report. This is one of the requirements from the CSRD. So with Credit to Credit Certified, we give you access to a list of which testing methods and uh, what are the different uh, best practices that need to be followed to fulfill the requirements of the certification that will then also uh, recognized as trustworthy by the, by the European Commission and by the C CSRD um, auditors. Um, you will also have, with the credit credit certification, you have a clear roadmap with different thresholds that are set and an idea of how do you um, improve over time uh, within three years of a certification uh, journey? How do you improve over time and showcase that you are constantly um, changing the way that you're designing uh, your products and also working with your suppliers? And um, the CSRD is asking companies to report yearly uh, on their sustainability achievements and therefore, at some point, it is important to, de to, to demonstrate um, an improvement. Um, it will be a bit weird to just stay, to say um, every, every three years, oh, we, we stayed at the same level um, with our, with our um, water consumption. While well, there are tools that are provided to, to decrease this um, water consumption. So it is quite interesting to see that the certification can give the tools to meet the requirements on many, many, many of these um, topics. And it also gives you um, unique added value from a, a couple of topics that the credit credit certification is assessing. Um, when we look at the material health, uh, it goes beyond what the REACH regulation is requiring. So it also gives you an incentive to promote uh, this on your reports and to explain that you have a specific methodology to assess the different chemicals that are within the product it's, and that you are completely removing the substances of concern thanks to the credit credit certification. Um, there's also the, the topics of land use change, animal welfare and effluent um, use that are not mentioned or very implicitly mentioned in the CSRD and this can bring additional um, strong commitments and, and strong um, verification in your in your report. Uh, and all of this we will go more in depth next week into which exact points are um, are uh, have been compared and what um, and what we found to be aligned and going beyond or not. Um, with the different requirements from Credit Credit Certified. But when we look at the different categories, taking in consideration that there are also general requirements, well, they are matching many of the, requir the disclosure requirements from the directive. Um, just looking at material health, we would think that it will only probably has an, have an impact on pollution, but no, it really has an impact on so many of these disclosure requirements. Um, similar to the water and salt stewardship and social fairness, etc. So next week, we will have a session that will be um, focusing on how can Credit Credit Certified support you in meeting the CSRD requirements. So we will go in depth in all of the different uh, points. And uh, the week after, we will go into the CSDDD, so the Corporate Stimity Due Diligence Directive, the EU Forced Labour Regulation, and also more in depth into what we gave you um, as an insight with the ESPR regulation. So very busy day. It will we will cover many of these these points. And I also want to um, to tell everyone that our web we will have a web page dedicated on regulations on our website where 
there will be um, a document to be downloaded for each of these pieces of legislation explaining what can be used from the certification for your um, for you to to fulfill these requirements from from the upcoming regulations or for what was already adopted. Um, so now we open it to questions. Could I um, jump in here, Lucy and, and Betty? Thanks so much. Um, I, I know that was a whistle stop tour around the issues and there will be other sessions um, which uh, we hope will will go deeper than that already deep analysis. There was a bunch of questions on the chat. Um, maybe Lucy and Baptiste, you can flick through that. A couple I just picked up on. First was Saskia. Good question. Of the 230 labels in the EU, how many go you know, above and beyond the RSL? Um, we haven't done a full analysis of that. Um, um, what we do know is the standards we've looked at, um, um, cradle to cradle, is, is it goes far, far above and beyond the standards we've seen that, that, that look at this um, by doing such a deep toxicology analysis um, that isn't, certainly goes way beyond any list-based approach. Um, that there was also a question from Niels and, and John Paul about uh, which Baptiste or Lucy, perhaps you can say a bit more about, about the recognition of the cradle to cradle scheme under the new legislation. Um, why don't I actually turn to you on that? I, I, I may wish to add, but I know you've been looking at this in, in, in more depth. I think the summary is we're really waiting to see the more detailed national legislations but, but but we believe we'll we'll absolutely meet that as as one of the the more or most rigorous standards out there. But but Baptiste and Lucy, um, please on this or or any of the other great questions I saw on the list here. Thank you, Elwin. I'm happy to give it um, uh, to you to go, and then after uh, Lucy, you can uh, you can add on. So therefore, the idea, if I take the angle of the legislation, so uh, to come back to the question that was asked um, today, what we know is that in terms of process. Indeed, for every certification scheme, they will have to be validated, reviewed and validated by a member state, only one, not all of them. And once they are approved by a member state, the certification scheme, in this case, cradle to cradle, will be part of a EU list of certification scheme that meet the requirement of the substantiating green claim directive. Again, all the requirements are not finalized. There is still upcoming, uh, there is still ongoing conversation that are expected to close by March 2025. But we know, let's say, 80 to 90 percent. The debate now lasts on a few topics, carbon decarbonization or other, other elements. But therefore, yes, the process will be um, to uh, ab uh, apply um, and to be revisited by some member state authorities. Lucy, do you want to complement? Um, I see there's also a, a question. Yeah, this question, uh, it's um i had just one other question that was linked to that so the um, part of the green claims directive there will be a requirement for certification there will be requirements for certifications and therefore once our certification will be uh, uh accredited by one of the national body they will be um, um verifying our our um, certification standard but also how our, how we are organized as a, a certification uh, as a company, um, then we will um, be ac accredited throughout the whole European Union and therefore we will be able to verify the claims and we will also be able to verify if you are ESPR compliant or if you are uh, compliant with other regulations that will give the, the green light. But thanks both. Um, you see the other questions in the chat. Are there any others you'd wish to jump in on? Yes, there is a question that was made regarding also the, the question from Andreas Ellenberger. Where can I find the list of products and materials which are part of the first ESPR working plan? So the key element is that the real work first plan will be communicated in March. Um, this is when you will have the full list of all of the products that will be already part of it. Today, there is work happening um, particularly on the uh, textile sector, um, and there is uh, some work happening on one of the commodities also. But that means that now we talk about um, a full work plan that will be communicated in March of next year. I actually want to add something for that. Um, I 
there will be the webinar on USPR uh, in two weeks, and I added in this uh, webinar two, uh, a slide explaining which intermediary products and which um, uh, final, uh, final products are first targeted for now. So we're not 100% sure yet, but there's um, um, a text, a draft text that is explaining that it will be steel, uh, cement, textiles, mattresses, toys, um, packaging, and constructions products. But I will have to um, verify this uh, information from my slides and you will have the documents ready to be downloaded uh, on our website as of next week. So you will have access to it also. You can, you can view it. I also want to, exp to, to tell everyone that in the chat, I have added the two links for the next two webinars, if you are willing to join. Um, and the, as I explained, also the documents will be all shared on our webpage and they will be um, publicly available for anyone to download. And if you have any uh, additional questions, you can always reach out to me and Baptiste also for further clarity. Okay, um, look, we, we've got a couple more minutes. Um, if there's no other questions you and Baptiste want to jump in on, um, we can start bringing this to a close. What we'll do is we'll look at some of those messages, which I know when you're presenting, it's hard to give detailed answers. Maybe we'll have a look after this call, and I think that chat we can still add things to. Let's see after the, the call ends and see if we can add any answers that occur to us after the call. Um, otherwise, we'll come back to this in some of the more detailed discussions. Um, so thanks a lot, and sorry we didn't get to all, all the questions that were raised, but I think you did share a lot of um, a lot of information here. Um, look, I think getting back to where I started, um, the um, what we want to do with Cradle to Cradle Certified is 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 really help you achieve change in your organisations and markets. And and the last thing that's going to help there is 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 requiring duplication of of important work. So this is what we're trying to convey here: is that that doing this certification, we've tailored it. Um, so that it, it's really a win-win. You're able to achieve that certification, the recognition that it comes with it, and also generate so much information to help meet um, and go above and beyond EU compliance. And we'll be getting more into those details in the subsequent sessions, which, which I really hope you can join. Um, so on this, Baptiste and Lucy, should we close or did you want to raise other things? Okay, let, let, let's get let's get, let let's close it there. Um, thank you so much all for joining. You see the huge interest here. Um, you can see a lot of this stuff is now on will be shared on our website, and and thanks particularly to Lucy and Baptiste for all the work on this. Thank you, thanks everyone, all. and hope bye -bye. to see you for the next webinars. Bye. Thank you all. Have a beautiful day. Bye bye. Bye bye.